Hey, everybody. Thanks for being with me again. This past week, when I'm recording this, we did our 200th episode of Grace to All. And I want to thank you all so much for your prayers and encouragement and financial support that continue to make that possible. Each month, we have several hundred dollars in expenses just for the podcast and videos and the uh, Pure Light Walker technical contracts and hosting and all that stuff. And your support, those of you around the world, help us encourage hundreds of other people around the world. And I so appreciate it. In our 200th episode, I had the great privilege of introducing and of interviewing rather my friend, Lydia Dutoit. She's an author, speaker. She's the wife of Francois Dutoit, <clears throat> the uh, Mirror Bible translator. And one of the things that she elaborated on in our 200th podcast this past week is how our children are so in need of being taught at an early age the truth about who God is, who they are, and who all people are. Now, she helps do that with her children's book, including the latest one, King Solitaire's Big Banquet, which is great. We got some copies, gave them to our grandkids and to kids at our group here in Lawrence. And this week, Papa and Jesus and Grace, I'm calling Holy Spirit Grace these days because she is the Holy Spirit of Grace, uh, focused with me on our time together some of what Jesus had to say about children. Now, most of the time when Jesus taught, there were several categories of people there in large crowds. There were everyday ordinary folks. There were sinners and reprobates. There were proud religious leaders, as the Message Bible calls them. There were hangers-on who just came hoping for a sideshow to maybe see a miracle or to get fed or something, get some free wine. And there were whole families there, young, old. I mean, they didn't have daycare and stuff like we do today. And of course, Jesus' buddies were there, his followers. Now, one day in a setting like that, his buddies ask him a question. It's recorded in Matthew 18, verses 1 to 11, which we're going to look at today. They said, Jesus, who's considered to be the greatest in heaven's kingdom realm? Well, first of all, <laughs> they didn't know, and neither did anybody else at the time know, what heaven's kingdom realm actually is. We know they didn't know because Jesus spent lots of time telling stories or parables that he usually started out by saying the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like this, explaining to them what it's really like. Now, we don't know why they asked that question, which one, who would be considered the greatest. Maybe they were just curious. Maybe they just wanted to know. Maybe they thought he would give them a formula for how to become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe they hoped he would say, well, you guys are, of course. After all, I chose you. You're my boys, right? Well, as usual, he stunned them and religious people who've read the recording of that ever since with his answer. Luke 18, verse 2, Jesus called a little child to his side and he said to them, learn this well. Unless you, speaking to the adults and to everybody, he said, unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a child, you'll never even experience heaven's kingdom realm. <laughs> wow. Dramatically change your way of thinking. Become teachable. Be like a little child filled with wonder. I mean, think about the implications of Jesus' answer to their question. Imagine being one of the disciples or being a proud religious leader who studied and gone to school and memorized the Hebrew scripture or a teacher of the law or just being a regular religious person as most of the Jews were in that day. I mean, you think you've got the answers. You've gone to synagogue every day. You've memorized all this kind of stuff. And Jesus said, ah, you guys need to dramatically change your way of thinking. You need to become teachable. Implication, they hadn't been teachable. You need to be like a little child filling with, being filled with wonder. Well, how can you start to think like a little child? 
one of the things is, is I'm learning, we've got to let go of all we've been dogmatic about. We need to ask the Holy Spirit of grace in us to show us what really is non-negotiable and what we should just let go of. I've been doing that these days. I used to have a long list of non-negotiables, you know, statement of faith, stuff like that. We had committees at our church when we started it that came up with a very long involved statement of faith and doctrines and stuff like that. Well, when I started to see the truth about <laughs> God, we threw all those things away. Now my personal statement of faith, what I'm, what I'm, what I'll go to the mat on is very short, <clears throat> really four things. First, God is unconditional, never failing, never ending love for all people. Second, God is totally good, pure light with no darkness. Third, God is grace in me, providing everything I need for everyone. And number four, all of this is true for everyone. We are all in God's family. Christ is all in all. Now, <clears throat> Jesus made a point to emphasize this thing about letting go and humbling yourself. He made a point to say, I'm not just talking a one-time thing. Verse four, he says, whoever continually humbles himself to become like this gentle child is the greatest one in kingdom's heaven realm. Gentle child, like not argumentative, not forcefully defending your view, just being humble and gentle. Humble means to see yourself as unimportant in your own eyes. Jesus says, have that attitude continually. Don't, don't think you know it all. Don't arrogantly think that you've got God all figured out and contained in a nice little box full of doctrines and dogmas and rules and statements of faith. No, <laughs> I, I saw a thing on Facebook. Uh, it, it's like a, a math equation that says the Bible plus your interpretation equals your interpretation. <laughs> that's, that's pretty correct, isn't it? What do you think Jesus meant when he said the greatest one in heaven's kingdom realm? I think heaven's kingdom realm is here and now. Jesus said that. They asked him one time, the proud religious leader says, when's it going to come? Jesus says, come. It's here right now. It's in you. And I think the people who experience it in the greatest way are those who see God as God really is, who see God in wide-eyed wonder that anyone could possibly be that good. They see that God is even better than they thought the day before, even better than they could possibly imagine or comprehend. Now, there are a lot of things with uh, the ancient church leader, Augustine, who lived in the third and fourth century that, uh, that I don't agree with, but I think he got this one right. He said this, if you understand it, it's not God. <laughs> Think about that. If you understand it, it's not God. God is so huge uh, in every way, so good in every way, we can't possibly understand it. All right, Jesus went on to say in Matthew 18, verse 5, and if you tenderly care for this little one on my behalf, you are tenderly caring for me, Jesus said. Well, how would you be tenderly caring for Jesus by tenderly caring for a little child? Christ is in that little child. <laughs> yeah. Verse six and seven, he says, now, if anybody puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him to have a heavy boulder tied around his neck and be hurled into the deepest sea than to face the punishment he deserves. Or seven, misery will come to the one who lures people away into sin. <clears throat> Troubles and obstacles to your faith are inevitable, but great de devastation will come to the one guilty of causing others to leave the path of righteousness. Well, those are scary words, aren't they? What does that mean? It certainly doesn't mean what I used to think it meant when I was into religion. It has nothing to do with religion's lie of hell. 
first he's saying misery is going to come to people who are guilty of causing others, especially little ones, to leave the path of righteousness. The path of righteousness is not something we do. It's who we already are. I've taught you all over and over again the different passages says that say that we are already righteous, which means we are, we are made right for God and with God, and we were made right with God before God ever created the heavens and the earth and anything in them. We were made, we're already right with God. The path of righteousness is where God has already put us. It's his doing. And Jesus said the night before he died that the Holy Spirit now continually reminds us that we are righteous. We are perfect with God. We're faultless and we're pure. So Jesus is saying here, misery is going to come to somebody who causes people to leave the truth of believing they are righteous. Misery. Misery is going to come to them because they themselves believe that. They live in fear from believing the lie that they are not righteous. They're miserable because they believe they're not right with God. God can't even stand to look at them. And they're believing that God will punish them in eternal conscious torment if they mess up, you know, sometime that they don't even know what they did. They're miserable because they live in fear. And they cause other people to live that way. This week, I read a wonderful little booklet by my friend George Saris called How Wide Are Heaven's Doors? It's a summary of his seminal, much larger book called Heaven's Doors, Wider Than You Ever Believe. It was one of the first books that I read several years ago that had a thorough biblical presentation with lots of research about how there is no hell as religion has taught us. Now, of course, now we know, or hopefully you know, that there are scores of books like that that have been written over the last couple of hundred years. Books that most of us involved in religion never knew about. They were <laughs> not talked about in our circles. These books, they all detail the research about Hebrew and Greek word meaning, what the early church believed, talk about translators, translators bias, all that kind of stuff is interesting for some of us. But when I finished that little booklet this week, I got an unexpected download from grace, the Holy Spirit of Christ in me. Here's what I heard grace say to me, Paul, these kinds of books are good and they have a purpose, but they don't reveal the real issue. The real issue which is what religious people incorrectly called sin. You know, Paul, the Spirit said to me, the word is harmartia, the Greek word. People missing the mark of our pure light with no darkness and pure unconditional, never failing, never ending love and hyper grace for all. The Spirit said to me, sin is not immoral actions or bad behavior. No, immoral actions and bad behavior are the result of us not knowing who God is, who we are, and who everybody else is. And then the Holy Spirit really got my attention. It's like, as Baxter Kruger says, this ticker tape went before my eyes, and I knew, okay, i got to pay attention here. Holy Spirit said to me, Paul, the real issue, the real issue of all life is seeing and knowing who God really is. The Holy Spirit of grace said to me, the real issue of life is knowing who we really are, who you are, and who all people really are. And sin is simply missing the mark of that truth. The Holy Spirit said, it's missing the mark. It's not seeing our true essence of who we really are. The sin of the world, the Holy Spirit said to me, is not believing that we are all good for all people all the time, and instead ascribing to us the dark character of Adam's angry, scary, fictitious, punitive, retributive, small g God that just doesn't exist, and especially teaching and believing and missing us so far that they think that God could even 
conceive of, let alone implement and carry out a place of eternal conscious torment. The Spirit said to me, Paul, that's the real issue. And Grace said to me, Paul, it's tragic when anyone believes that. You know that. But get this now. It's especially tragic when someone teaches a little child that we are like that. Grace said to me, when you teach little children that false concept of God, you cause little children to start living in misery. And I'm going to give you a graphic example of that a little later on. Being fearful of God. Little children especially need to know the truth, the real issue. And again, the Holy Spirit said to me, missing the mark of who we are, who God is, is the sin of the world. That's the real issue. Anybody, the Holy Spirit said, who believes that we are not good, all good, all the time for all people, anyone who believes any darkness about us simply doesn't know us. As Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know. They know about a fictitious man-made religious concoction who they've been told is God. And the Spirit said to me, Paul, don't give any more time trying to academically prove that translations and traditions are wrong. You know us. You don't have to prove or argue with anybody. Simply focus on and believe and teach and live who we really are. We are all good for all people, all the time. And the Spirit said, Paul, anything that says otherwise, and I wrote all this down, anything that says otherwise is simply false. It's not true. It's sin. It's missing the mark of perfect love. Don't focus your time on what's false. Devote your time and effort to knowing and experiencing perfect love. Be and teach pure, perfect love. Teach the real good news is we are not anything at all like religion's concept of a small g God. Jesus came to save you from believing that. And he did it by revealing who we really are. And Spirit said, religion's, quote, hell thinking, unquote, is the enemy. It's the enemy that comes to steal and kill and destroy people's knowledge of us. Hell thinking is from evil. Hell comes from evil. <laughs> the accuser, the condemner, the liar, the deceiver, the antichrist. And Grace said to me, Paul, any belief that we are not all good all the time for all people, that's the sin of the world. That's missing the mark of perfect love. That's living in darkness. And the worst thing anybody can do is to teach those lies to anybody else, especially little children who had their whole life to live before them. Jesus taught and wants us all to know that little children don't need Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic understanding. They don't need doctrine or dogma or rituals. They only need to know that God is all good all the time for all people. That's the real issue. And the Holy Spirit concluded by saying, instead of us being like the Pharisees and teachers of the law, the proud religious leader who searched for eternal life in the Hebrew scriptures, instead of that, Let's now let the living word of God, the teacher, grace in us, show us what God is really like. Now, in the next few verses, the language Jesus uses is hyperbole. He uses figures of speech to emphasize things when he says things like cutting off your own hands and feet and plucking out your eyes and being thrown into Gehenna, the trash dump that was always on fire, or being thrown into a lake with a big boulder tied around your neck. He's exaggerating, which was a very common thing in, uh, in his day and age in his society, to make a point. It was a very common teaching tool. Those who believe in a literal reading of Scripture, when you look at this passage, you might as well go out and get some surgical saws and eye gougers, and <clears throat> after you do that, then throw yourself in a trash heap that's burning. <clears throat> it's all hyperbole to get a point across. Now, after this hyperbole, he goes on to talk about not corrupting little ones or anyone's childlike faith in the only true God and who the only true God really is. Verse 10, he says, be careful to not corrupt one of these little ones. He was teaching Jews 
whose way of life centered around religion, keeping religious laws, fearing religion's God, trying to please and appease and gain and maintain favor of religion's God. He was, he was talking to them and said, that God doesn't even exist. Now he's saying, as you guys have grown up, that's today. Uh, Jesus was saying this to people then, but he's saying it to us too. As we've grown up, religion has taught us all these things, but I'm saying no, dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a little child. Papa, Jesus, and Grace have just been impressing on me all this week to listen to them about the mystery of simplicity. We see it best in the wide-eyed wonder of a little child. Their life is simple and full of wonder. Our little grandson, who's four years old, comes over to play with us two, three times a week, and he's just full of wonder. He's just excited. He's having a good time. See, when little children live in an atmosphere that has not been corrupted, they know they're safe. They know their parents, their grandparents are good. They know their parents and grandparents love them unconditionally. They know they're kind and nice and patient and gentle. Gentle. They know their parents and grandparents like them and love being with them. They know that they're going to continue providing for them. They don't worry about how they're going to be provided for. They know their parents and grandparents have their best interest at heart. They know they're going to provide everything they need. They don't need to worry about anything. They can just relax and play and enjoy life. They never even consider that their parents and grandparents are keeping a secret book with a list of all of their wrongs. <laughs> they never even consider that their parents could be so full of wrath and so angry with them that they might kick them out of the family and punish them horribly forever. No, they know they can trust their parents and their grandparents. They know they're not fickle or bipolar. They know their parents and grandparents love everyone and don't hate anybody. They have no fear of their parents or grandparents. They live in pure light with no trace of darkness. Little children are creative. They visualize and imagine things. They're full of joy. They're not searching for significance or trying to prove how much they know or they belong. Now, most of us got at least some of those things from our earthly parents and grandparents. And in those areas, we flourished. And we believe that God was like that. Of course, in some areas, our parents fell short. They were doing the best they could with what they knew, and many times with what they'd been taught, the lies they'd been taught with religion. Now, in the areas that we weren't taught the truth, we tend to think that God is like that, and that God falls short, and God is dark. A Facebook friend of mine posted this next quote a couple of days ago. She said, she asked a question, is it possible that when a parent themselves has a fear-based relationship with God, they can pass it on to their children in an atmosphere of fear? She said, I grew up that way with my own mother telling me that God would punish me for my disobedience much more than she ever could. And as a matter of fact, she said, God's going to give you a deformed child. She said, I cried every single day of my first and only pregnancy many years later in fear of that being true. She lived in misery at what have, should have been the most incredible blessing time of her life being pregnant with her first child she lived in misery now her mom who i don't know i'm sure thought she was doing the right thing by scaring her into having good behavior well not at all just the opposite back to our passage today jesus said if anyone puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me then he used pretty stark hyperbole to show us how harmful that is, both to our children and to, our, and to us. Now, we can lament the areas where we didn't get a good childhood, where we maybe weren't filled with wild-eyed wonder and you know, didn't know who God really was. Or we can be joyful that not only today, even at our age, we can dramatically change our way of thinking 
and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a little child. Because then and only then can we create that kind of environment for our children and grandchildren. And for those of us who don't have children and grandchildren, for anybody else that we're with. This month, my wife, Kitsy, and I have two grandkids with birthdays. And our son, Jay, celebrates his 38th birthday. He's our youngest. That shows you I'm old. <laughs> well, like most of you, we have kids and their spouses and other grandkids and birthdays. With They all have birthdays all throughout the year. Well, what's the very best, most lasting, most valuable gift we can possibly give them? A childlike wonder about their heavenly father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, grace, an environment where they know they are safe, not just with us, but eternally safe, where they know God is good and God loves them unconditionally and God likes them and likes being with them, an environment where they know God is patient and gentle and completely good, an environment where they know God provides for them and meets their needs and has their best interest at heart and is continually working everything for good, an environment where they love and trust and enjoy God and never fear that God is judging, condemning, shaming, or rejecting them or anyone else. When you grow up with the fear that God hates certain people and is going to punish them forever and keeps a list of their record of wrongs, most people also think, oh, he could do that to me at any time. We want to create an environment. God wants an environment where kids know, where we all know that we can trust God and know God's never going to change. He's not bipolar. He's not keeping a list of our wrongdoing. He's not condemning us or anybody. He doesn't have a, we don't have to meet a certain standard that he has, or otherwise he's going to reject or punish us. No, an environment. God wants us all to know this environment, to be like little children, wide-eyed children, and know that we live in an environment with God where we need never question whether or not we belong. We are included and loved and accepted forever, no matter what. We can, with our children and grandchildren and with everybody else we're with, we can show them what the real issue of life is. The real issue is God is good for all people all the time. Most people just simply don't know that yet. But the good news is they will know and we get to help them. How cool is that? Hey, everybody. Thanks again for being with me. Glad to have you all. I look forward to being with you again next week. Love you all.